All right, cool. I am very ready. And I'm sorry, are you okay? Are you set up? Almost there. Okay. okay. Um, That's well, it. Done. Okay, good. Um, thank you very much. I really enjoyed giving the talk that this originally came from, which was about 18 months ago, um, where I had a grand plan to produce a system for automatically turning scanned paper into a nice archive of searchable PDFs. Did this happen? Let's find out. <laughs> um, so the original talk was called Mostly Searchable, um, and this is a bit more than Mostly Searchable with my terrible handwriting up the top. Um, so I had literally boxes of paper that were all the old bills going back years and stuff, and I didn't even know which ones I was supposed to get rid of and shred. Um, they were getting all over the place, and it was also just as we were transitioning, all, everything was coming electronically as PDFs from the utilities. And so there's a lot of junk on my computer and a lot of junk in my basement. Um, I couldn't find what it was. I couldn't, if I was asked to find a paper, it was usually like all Saturday in the basement swearing at piles of paper. So, you know, lots of stuff in the way. I could not find a thing. I knew it was all in the house somewhere and I had lots of stuff I didn't need, but couldn't find it. So, oh, shoot. Oh no, this is the right one. So consequently, I was massively frustrated. Technology was not being my friend, and while I look nothing like Harry Dean Stanton, um, this is what I felt like smashing everything up. This is from Repo Man, by the way, my favorite movie. Um, what I really wanted was a nice searchable archive, and zero effort, of course, to set it up. Done for free. Um, get rid of all the paper junk. I did get a really nice shredder, and that's more fun than anyone should ever have. Um, I also wanted this to be automatic, and um, I kind of also wanted unicorn and a pony, and, 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 but I didn't get that. However, um, I did have, because I do a fair chunk of graphic stuff, a very, very large printer. Um, the Epson Workforce series is, the I think, the biggest one they made at the time. Uh, they no longer make the 7520, but there's an equivalent one. This can scan, print up to 13 by 19. Um, it has a built-in sheet feeder that will scan on both sides. Um, it is networked. It, the SD card appears as a Samba share, and it is genuinely the size of a small bus. It is honest, it, I can't think of any table here that it would easily fit on. Surprisingly, it was cheap. Uh, 2012, I think it was 299. It also, for an inkjet, has reasonable running costs. The newer version is much more expensive, it's nearly 500, but it uses ink tanks, which last for years and years and years, and are even cheaper to run. Um, so this was a good way of producing PDFs or some kind of images from pieces of paper. And I, I have run literally tens of thousands of pages through this scanner, and it only jams very rarely. So the really nice thing about it is you can, you can mount the memory card. This is my stupidly long um, FS tab entry. Uh, it's probably got more stuff in here because the version of Ubuntu that I have doesn't just allow you to have guessed. You actually have to specify the password for guests, so even though it doesn't actually use the password for guests. And then some other junk in there that I have no idea why it works, but it doesn't work without it. Did I find this on Stack Overflow? Not telling. Um, <laughs> To do this, it doesn't need any drivers. It's a nice, solid, reliable scanner that does both sides in a fairly clever way. And it's good enough. I know that Hugh has a really nice scanner, but I don't have his kind of money. Can we ask you what scanner he has? Uh, he has the Fujitsu, very expensive above the scan snap. There's a document. Yeah, it's, 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 it's about a grand, but if you're if you have it you basically just drop paper in it and it does the magic thing and it's very fast oh it's amazingly fast and i go at it not because i want to spread money around you know i'm cheap i asked the driver writer of this same drivers for these things he said that was the one to get and that's as good a reason as any unfortunately this wonderful bus sized scanner of mine <laughs> um has some some fairly major drawbacks. 
it will always start renaming file names epsilon001, no matter what. And once you delete them, it will start again. And it doesn't ever create a unique file name. The clock is always wrong. It doesn't support NTP. And it doesn't support time zones either. So if you happen to the clock set correctly for what it says on the screen, the network time is, is hours off. And it also drifts a lot. So it's really, really terrible. The other thing is, because it's a simple device, you start scanning, the network share just evaporates, gone. And any attempt to run a daemon on this, it will freak out. It will create all these logs like, I can't find the share, I can't find the share. Ah. So bad. Also, um, this is uh, a bit less of an issue because it's more of an image processing thing. To save space, it uh, scans alternate pages, duplex the wrong way up. This is less of a problem than you might think, but it is when you start picking the images apart. It can be a real, real issue. So it's not great. I could work, work around some of these things. I'm sure if I spent long enough um, studying and, and giving offerings to the rsync manual, I could find something that would get the files across and make sure they were kind of correct and not duplicate, yes? Is this where a little a couple months ago there was a discussion going on? Maybe. 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 Perhaps. Um, you could use something clever in rsync to get these across without deleting old stuff accidentally. I, I can't remember who told me about Incron. Oh, it was at the Raspberry Pi meeting last month. Somebody mentioned Incron. And it's kind of magic. It's basically whenever a new file is created, um, you get a cron-like event. So you can do things based on that. I'm sure you folks have been using Incron forever and go, this is baby stuff. But to me, this is magic. Um, I, the best way of using Incron that I found is that if you notify when a file is closed, that means you don't get lots of spurious stuff you don't want. The other thing is, if I really wanted the timestamps of the files right, I could save a timestamp from a machine, a goods timestamp, and then do something with stat. It's hand wavy. I'm waving my hand here. I don't think I could get this to work very well. Um, I could use touch. Um, but, but you want to induce a particular timestamp. Yes, because the file, the timestamp on the Samba file system is wrong, always. So if I touched it, it would still have the wrong time. It's loaded now, and you want it to still load four hours ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. lots of things are wrong. Question, like, it may be wrong, but it's consistently wrong. So it, it's like the first file was made two minutes before the second file, which was made two minutes before the third. Or is it just random as well? No, no, the, file, the timing would be right. Okay. Um, I actually, this device can, in fact, send faxes. And for the one fax I need to send a year, legally in Canada, you're supposed to have the correct time on your fax machine. So if you have the correct time, you have the wrong network time. Mm -hmm. Oh. So, yeah. Not a technical question. It's, yes. Why did you need to get access to this information at all? Okay, spectacular question. Um, one of the reasons was um, at the time I was closely, very closely tracking my energy usage and I needed access to all my old hydro bills and my gas bills and all of the old pieces of paper that you used to get. Um, so I was obsessively keeping records of that. Also, um, we were... Our household finances are complex, given for the two of us, there's far more than two nationalities going on. So being able to find bank information is really, every year at tax time is like, ah, you don't want to know. So this kind of paper I did need to find, but I'm no good at setting up file systems. I usually just stuff them in a box and lose them. Yeah. Practical you should probably shred everything that you don't legally need to keep. I did, but I didn't even know what stuff I didn't. So one of the efforts that I did, once I had l at least got the documents of a certain age, 
I knew that things beyond like five years, in some case, seven and others, I could just shred. But getting them in, you know, order from a box which contained gas bills, empty envelopes, odd socks, um, very dead spiders, lots and lots of uh, basement centipede casts, um, you know. I and, that. No, <laughs> it's such a loss. But I did discover there's an amazing company in Mississauga who makes huge format fabric printers, Gandhi Digital. If you ever want to see something super impressive, they make a 10 meter wide ultra color inkjet. Don't ask how much that costs, <laughs> but it's beautiful. Anyway, back to my bus size printer. Um, so therefore, this thing kicks out PDFs or JPEGs for some unknown reason. But when I wanted to archive files, what do I and I store them as? So I looked at CBZs, which some of you will have no idea what they are. And others go, oh, of course, I know what that is. DJ vu or deja vus, PDFs, and anything else I could think of. But the most important thing is they had, they had to have a file that was a standard. It was one that was maintained, so I couldn't have one that hadn't been looked at in the last 10 years. And it had to be archival, that the reader was not going to go away. All of these were actually surprisingly hard to meet. Why are we going backwards? <clears throat> I don't understand why it's going backwards. Is it because of the position of my mouse on the screen? Anyway, CBZ is a ridiculously simple file format. It is a comic book archive for scanned comics, um, sometimes illicitly scanned comics. It's a zip file of JPEGs. And amazingly, it's supported by a whole bunch of document readers. Um, Unfortunately, its idea of a metadata standard is some forum postings on a very old PHP BB board, which may or may not go away, and you have to look in archive.org to find the standard. Uh, so maybe not. If I gave this to, say, an accountant, they'd have no idea what it was. And also, while there is an, was a proposal to have searchable text in the CBZ, Nobody ever quite found a standard way of doing it. So, well, it is genuinely, you know, if you have JPEGs and the files are in a sensible order, put it in a zip file, call it something CBZ, and you've just made one. It's that simple. Um, I did find a better way of archiving JPEGs in a PDF, though. There's a tool called IMG to PDF that will take PDF, uh, JPEGs like from a digital camera, stick them in a PDF so they're all viewable as individual pages, but then you can extract the files unchanged using one of the tools from Poplar. So you can actually move things about in a PDF in a way that normal people can read for reasonable values of normal. But so CVZ, nice and simple, not quite cut it. Yes, yes, there are. Um, PDF, which I will come to, is a wonderful meta file, which is a lovely way of saying it can hold anything and it will describe how it's held, but it, it leaves the decoding up to you. So unless you have the codec, you're stuck. Um, so yes, lots of ways of holding JPEGs. The next format, Deja Vu, which some of you may remember. That strange feeling of, no. Um, um, about, what, 15 years ago, deja vu was going to be everything. Every document was going to be deja vu. It was like slash dot, it was like, yeah, we're going to do everything deja vu for some reason. It was a website. Why would you do that? Yes, it supports searchable text. It has some really clever encoding to crush down images to be really small and have, it's pretty clever. Unfortunately, they're like, it's open ish. There's an agreement for a company which I think has just been bought by some very, very large company that says, we won't sue you if you use this. That's not really, I don't know. Well, also, that was technically not true anymore since the patent question is expired. 
but they might still try to They might claim some, some, I don't know. No, but that, that was the reason why at the time it was, the, you know, we'll, we'll be okay with this, because the patent itself was going to expire in like two or three years. Ago. Okay, I thought the patent was like 2001 it was made, so anyway, it doesn't matter. The other thing is, the maintenance in this well, it's kind of got the stank of deprecation to it. It's it's got that source forge smell to it, you know. You go to it and you see, while well, there has been an update in 2015, the last previous code review was in 2006, and then there was one in 2001. So it's like, uh, I don't think many people are looking at this or really caring about this anyway, and I shouldn't start storing documents in this format. So nice idea. Internet Archive still uses it, loves it, but not for me. It's why the hell is it going backwards? So the Internet Archive isn't enough of a guarantee for you. It's an arbitrary JavaScript. Yes. No. Um, the archive archive.org, yes, but equally, I'm not. They might just have a. a um, legacy server that generates it so I don't there's no browser plugin or well no browser plugins don't work anymore so you you can't really use it but so the last and most stupid format I mean why would anybody want to even consider PDF because it can have as, as Chris was shocked to see arbitrary JavaScript that can in theory run at any time and has access to your file system now, mercifully, that's only in the Adobe Reader, which if we're running Linux, we can't run because they don't support it anymore. Um, PDF. Can you mention something? Like, I used to be really into PDF before, and they do have an archival standard. I'm getting to that. Okay. Don't worry. All right. I've worked in prepress and document storage uh, for uh, a semi-legal company and an engineering utility. So, um, yeah. Don't worry, we're getting there. Um, if, while it supports uh, fill in forms, this is nothing to, Adobe has two completely incompatible standards for forms that you cannot convert even in Adobe's own software. One is called uh, Live Cycle, which people in the industry call Death Spiral, because it's, <laughs> if you have a Live Cycle document, you'll never be able to edit it again. It's horrible, horrible, horrible. All Ontario government documents are produced in life cycle. Actually, it should be PA4, which is the official format of Canadian documents. That is a, you've probably never seen PA4. It is something that is the height of a letter page, but the width of A4. And you can, inf some government printers will have a PA4 uh, feeder and they will print on PA4. And it's only government documents and it's only Canada. And can you buy it? <laughs> At a huge expense, of course. <laughs> can you just buy A4 paper and cut it? Cut the top and bottom off? That's, that's subversive talk, Alex. How dare you? Could you just use normal letter paper and just eat it? Yeah, and it'll just print you with a bigger margin. <laughs> this is this, this is something. This must have been here. Yeah, can we allow? Yes, yes. Um, as, as someone who actually cares about what paper shape paper is, uh, letter paper is an absolute abomination and should be destroyed. So um, A4 would be ideal for me. However, um, the other thing, PDF, whoever came came up with the the standard over years and years and years was basically trolling because you can have something that appears on the page that doesn't actually correspond to the searchable text. You can re-encode the text, so you can have the characters appearing as rote 13, but when you copy and paste the text, it's actually in regular text. It, it is it, there, there are so many ways you can make a PDF that is non-accessible. And then you've got Adobe, who, well, they're Adobe. They, they do their own thing and they contradict themselves and they just really make no sense, even to themselves. The trouble is they want to make money at an open standard. I know. There's a contradiction or three there. So this is a quote from an online friend of mine, Plinth, who 
If you ever get a chance, Plint's blog, if you're a developer and I've been developing for a long time, he has worked on some very old systems and he'll dredge up stuff that you'll go, oh shit, I forgot how horrible that was. Anyway, he was one of the first developers for Adobe on Acrobat and he said online, PDF is a file format that is made to be able to represent marks on a page. It dictates neither how those marks are made nor whether or not they carry any meaning. <laughs> so you could have something that looks exactly like these words, but there's no searchable text on the page. And that, to me, sums up PDF perfectly. However, PDF is a standard, or several standards. There is ISO 32001, which is all the technology is under a royalty-free public patent license. There is a free copy of the standard available, which is identical to the official standard, but you can get it for free. This seldom happens. Um, there is also, as you referred to, an archival format called PDFA. It's developed in Canada, sorry. Um, um, that fell flat. Um, PDFA. Oh, <laughs> I know, I know. Yes, 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 yes. yes. Um, I could go into more depth on how to create PDFA. You can do it very easily on a, on a normal Linux box. And it does guarantee that everything in that file is frozen. Um, it doesn't contain any technology that is you know, non-open. Non and it is guaranteed that a PDF reader will read it. This is good. The other thing is screen, read, screen readers for, access, for accessibility, they all support PDF. It has nice searchability and metadata hidden in there. I was going to say something. I saw a lovely slide. Metadata is your gift to the future, which I wish more people did. The other thing you can do with PDF, if you must, you can legally digitally sign it with an X509 certificate. Now, I'm not sure whether a Let's Encrypt certificate you could use, but it, in the reader, it allows you to say, this is signed, not necessarily encrypted, but so that it's like it has not been changed from when I made it. That, that's not important to me, but I did have an application that I did use PDF signing, and it's kind of cool. It's also equivalent to a legal signature in Canada. A lot of people don't know that. So maybe PDF isn't the worst file format after all. So I had to come up with a workflow. And the difficulty, if you're faced with like a, a Debian or Ubuntu machine, you have so many choices. And what do you start with? The big issue is that you're never going to get as easy to use software on Linux that does OCR and image processing, because there's a bunch of patents that are held by a company called Nuance, who now own OmniPage and Dragon Dictate, and all the things to do with recognition. And they ain't letting that. I remember when OmniPage for Linux was available. I loved it. I even paid for it. Um, it was good, but they don't make it anymore. So there's really three phases to this process. You have to process the image from the scanner, and I really should go into more depth to that because some people have expressed some interest in it. You have to do the OCR to generate the text layer, and then you have to stick all the files back together to make the PDF you insert. This is the overview, the fiddly overview I gave from my last talk. Um, you're basically going from the scanner to your searchable PDF. Um, the tools from Poplar, which is also known as XPDF, there's kind of like a fork, and I don't understand the particular beef between the XPDF and Poplar camps, but the Poplar one does things better. Um, so if your scanner produces PDF, Poplar will extract those pages to TIFF, an ancient file format, but it's very standard. Then you can take those individual pages of, of TIFFs, run them through Tesseract OCR, and it creates an OCR layer in a file called a Hoker format, which is basically a really badly messed up HTML file that has, indicates where words are in positions in the page. It's like the worst mess of HTML you've ever seen. Does it use an image map? No, but it gives you coordinates that you could create an image map from if you really want to. There's other tools that do this. There's the PDF to HTML will produce an image map. It's also part of Poplar. And then there's this horrible and 
somewhat unmaintained piece of Ruby called PDF beads. I've got nothing against Ruby itself, but this particular piece of Ruby is, is nasty. Um, but it's the thing that ties everything together. And it takes the TIFF files and the text files, converts the text to an invisible PDF. There's one thing. Like all sensible file systems, PDF has a flag to say, is text visible or is text not? And the, the whole basis of having a searchable text layer or image is based on having text that's there, you just can't see. Um, it's defined in the standard. It's a bit weird, but it works. So you end up running through these three programs. You end up with a lovely searchable PDF that's really small, like a few pens of K per page, fully searchable, but not the most accurate OCR. Now, I really should have introduced it at the beginning, and then the rest of you could have actually gone to sleep. There is a tool, it's a GTK tool, or no, it's a QT tool, called Scan Tailor, which if you've scanned a book and have got these horrible double page scans, pretty much magically will split it into pages with no thought. A lot of clicking, you have to do lots of apply to, apply to for the whole book. But I converted this 161 page novel to individual TIFF files that were perfectly straight in about two minutes, which was pretty good. Unfortunately, yeah, including the pro its processing time as well. So it's not, I had these from an old scanner, I just imported them, and it, it, did, it detected the splits, it did the corrections, it worked out the margins, and it created this, and it was really, really good. Unfortunately, like so many Linux products, if it could have just had like 5% more capability and done the OCR, it would have been great, but it doesn't. So this is really good if you want to kind of see what your pages look like. I don't, I like doing batch shell scripts. So most of my work is done with either the Poplar tools. PDF info tells you basic stuff about PDF, what the page size is. PDF images will both extract the images that are in a file but also, and also tell you what the resolution is. This is important because scanners will embed the size of the page in the resolution. For some reason, scanners always scan like 300 DPI, 600 DPI, but inkjet printers are 360 DPI, 720. Why? I don't know. Why do we even use DPI when they're mostly made in Japan? I don't know. Um, the PDF to PPM is probably, it sounds like it'd be a very crude tool but it's actually the best way of converting PDFs to images, to page images there is. It does lots of really clever anti-aliasing and makes beautiful, beautiful pages. Um, unfortunately, the guys who make Poplar have decided that they just want to extract the images as embedded in the file. They don't want to read any of the metadata in the PDF that says, this image is upside down, this image is at an angle because you can do these translations in PDF. And my scanner saves a lot of time by scanning first page the right way up, and then when it's doing dupl duplex, it scans the second page the other way up. In the PDF, you'd never see it, but once you've extracted the images from PDF, page one's that way up, page two is the wrong way up, and so on. Could there be some easy tooling of beat it to a third tool that says, let me reorient. There is, and there, it is a very easy tool, and we're about to come to it, but it's also a tremendously slow tool to do that. Um, the other thing that create, converts PDFs to images is good old GoScript, and I can almost guarantee that every Linux user has GoScript on almost all of their machines. Uh, it used to be used for all forms of printing. Um, as a former PostScript programmer, I love it. Um, it's far too big, but it, it's a great way of handling PDFs and postscripts if you're unlucky to have to deal with postscript documents anymore. Um, the OCR stage. There's really only one piece of OCR software that does anything like getting text that is kind of readable out, and that's Tesseract. It's a Google code project. It was formed by HP in the mid-90s. It's limited. It's not 100%, but it's pretty good. 
One thing though, make sure you're using a recent version. Some distributions give an ancient version of the code that does terrible things and just does not work. Uh, some recent, even some recent Debian ones have got stuff that's like three or four years old and is almost unusable. You can use it to guess scan orientation. You can run an image through it and it will say, I think this thing needs to be turned 270 degrees. But it takes about five seconds a page to do that on most machines, even quite fast ones. So it's very, very slow. Isn't there, from what you said, it sounds like there's metadata hiding in there. There is. Saying that, it, that, that it's been rotated. There's or, no. The, or, the, or the software, the, the um, software on your scanner doesn't say. There is some arbitrary transformation code in the PDF. So you'd actually have to look through the PDF stream and see, oh, this is applying a transformation matrix to this image. Uh, parsing PDF data streams is... Yeah. Yeah, great, good. We've got some people who've tried doing that. Yeah. Run away. Um, okay. Tesseract is a very simple program. You can basically get an image to text with just the sep specifying one image file. You can create those Hoker files, which are those weird OCR or HTML files. But you can also, and this is a fairly recent thing that some distributions don't have included. Oh, crap, typo. Um, I meant to say that that, can't you tell I copied and pasted? Um, you can create a PDF directly that contains the searchable text layer. The only disadvantage of Tesseract is it will only take one image file. So if you've got a multi-page document, you have to create all these files and then wedge them together somehow. The way I do it is I take all of the TIFFs and use a program called TIFFCP to join them all together in one file and then run it through Tesseract. This, if you're happy enough with the sort of 30 to 50K per page that this produces for a black and white image, good, stop here, go no further, because this is where far too much optimization and messing around has happened. Um, A little aside, um, if you want to use different scripts and if you have a lot of documents printed in a particular font, it's really, really worth training Tesseract to understand the font. And this is Fraktur. It's the older German print style. It has some spectacularly hard to read for us characters, uh, like uh, this word here, um, that thing that looks like a T or an F with a little quiff is actually a K, and the thing next to it is a T. And it's like, I can barely tell the difference from here in big text. I had to learn that in high school. You poor sod. <laughs> At least it wasn't. It was a nightmare. I was supposed to be learning the language, and I spent all my time trying to translate this goddamn script. There is a handwritten version of, <clears throat> of Fracture from the early 20th century that is utterly unreadable and there are legal secretaries in Germany who are paid a lot of money just to learn how to read it because there's, there's wills written in it and no one can read it and it doesn't even look like text it looks like a dead mouse dragging stuff across it anyway you've also got crazy things like you've got long s's which run into t's and then you've got um tz characters tz, and yeah but yes you've got there is i don't actually see it yeah double long s's but they don't have the Doesn't that the third last letter of the second word, D thing? Oh, that's K. Yes, it's a K. Fraction. Yeah, the fraction. This is a really boring thing about municipal taxes in Danzig, 1923. Um, someone has to be interested in this, right? Um, however, uh, Tesseract made a pretty good job without any training, just using the 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 Fracture pre-trained data that you can download for any system. So the training process can be a bit slow. I found some fonts that it can't learn. Like I've been trying to teach it some uh, mid-60s IBM line printer stuff from bad scans, and it just cannot recognize those. It's just, I don't know what there is about. Since then, you had a Polish and a German government. During the Weimar Republic, Danzig was a German I don't think protector it was the right word. How about land grab? Um, it was a free city. It was a free city, um, and they had to make up all their own. It had its own parliament, and they had to 
write down all of the rules, and it was very, very democratic, and anyone could sit in. And these scans were from somebody who'd kept the documents. They were just a, an ordinary person, and they've got interesting little comments on, like, I really don't like what this councillor is saying, or, no, we, we shouldn't do this. Oh, this is a great idea. I want to support this. So you can see what this person was thinking. Um, it's the University of Gdansk has all of these. Um, and if you're an obscure European history nerd, which I sometimes am, this stuff is amazing. My German isn't really very good, but I can kind of understand it. Google Translate really is your friend with this. Um, but when I said that Tesseract is multilingual, I'm really sorry. When I say multilingual, it's European-centric. All the other wonderful scripts of the world are just, I don't know. I don't know. Um, they're hard. Um, is, is it inherent that it's, uh, a Mandarin recognizer would be difficult, or just nobody's done it? I think. I would argue things like Arabic might be possible, but Mandarin starts becoming difficult because, like, there's no real standard way to do a lot of that on a Chinese script. I guess. I mean, Arabic definitely doable because it's very standard. But um, uh, actually, there is an Arabic package for Tesseract, so maybe I'm a bit wrong. Um, Korean for sure. Korean is very, very regular, super regular. Um, my almost year of working for Samsung, I learned that. Um, How is Tesseract with handwritten uh, stuff? How's your sense of humor? Um, it's, yeah, it's, it, if you have very, very regular handwriting, you'll get 20% of the characters. Okay. So almost useless. Yeah. Miles? So, um, this, uh, I used uh, the Python library for Tesseract a long time ago yep. to do something, and I spent about six months trying to get to train it on my handwriting. So basically, I would do scans of my notebook, write, type out what it said, and kind of did some machine learning based off of it, it's next to impossible. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have created a font. It, it was a little better at the end. Yeah, so it's one of these things that the, the effort is. Um, the commercial package, Abbey Fine Reader, does recognize handwriting and does a remarkably good job of it. Now, if your handwriting looks like mine, in other words, like a broken clock, no chance. But it, I'm, I was amazed that. Sort of regular I, I was amazed that Abby could actually pick up the odd character of mine. Um, Abby doesn't run in Linux, so we can't talk about it here. Come on. Yeah, and when I say it's accurate ish, it is ish. Um, this is from one of my electricity bills. So, didn't get transmission, calls it transmission and kilowatt hours and with an at sign is all messed up. However, most important thing is I'm not looking for this system to be like a proofreader. I want to stick this in an index such that I can find files. And if I need to do something clever, at least I can get identify the 10 files that might interest me, then I can look at those files and go, well, it's actually that one, rather than have a magic system that will just give me the one true file. Because getting that one true file is a lot of work, and far more work than I want to put in. Um, so it's readable, human readable, it's sort of machine readable, and the files aren't too big. So I can live with that. You might not be able to, you might want perfect text, and that takes a lot more work. Um, Seriously, how much, how much does it cost per page to process it? And some, this is, your time as money is a, diff, is a really difficult metric. Exactly, exactly. And so if I can kind of at least identify what directory the file's going to be in, and if there's like 10 files in it, I'm OK going through those files going, oh, it's that one. So it didn't find anything about that 590, that distribution chart. Notice that's so that third line. It didn't? Ah, it wasn't that, though, there was a, a damage in the scan or something? So oh, okay. there's actually a fold there that's got ink across it, and it, it was going, that doesn't look like text at all. Ah, thank you. Thank you. That's so good. This is a very old bill, actually, um, looking at those rates. I understand. I understand. I understand. I understand. I understand. I understand. I understand.
used in I deny having a grow up entirely. Um, <laughs> there was one in our street. It was really cool, and the police raided it. Um, the one disadvantage of, of Tesseract is that it is amazingly slow, uh, especially if you've serialized all your TIFF files into a single file. It starts at page one and goes, and it just uses one core to do it. And most of us have more than one core. So I took this novel um, called Willard and His Bowling Trophies by Richard Brodkin, my absolute favorite novel, I think. Um, it's great. Um, I had one big TIFF file, which I created using TIFFCP. The TIFF tools are amazing. They're also written by one of the people who was a major contributor to Toy Story, all the Toy Story movies. And then you run Tesseract on that, and for 160 odd pages on my manky old quad core, took five minutes, which is too much, frankly. And that's five minutes for all 161 pages? Yes. Why, why do you consider that too slow? Because I was really wanting to run this on a Raspberry Pi, oh, okay. which is approximately 20 times slower. And so. But the real question is is it really 20 times slower? Or is it just you're not oh, using the I find it. Yeah. Well, no, well, the thing is, like, remember, things like uh, quad cores basically uh, decide, okay, well, you know, you have four cores, so we're going to multiply the actual speed of your, your, your machine by four. No, but you, if you could turn it into four TIFF files, yes. then you could get, so you might be able to do some, some pieces in parallel. We are coming to this. In fact, um, so basically, this was getting one core extremely hot, and uh, like that GIF where there's like you know core number one and everyone else is there. So it, I think you said it's the one that's the, the dude break dancing and everyone else is like standing around. Anyway, um, so however, we can do parallelism. So the same source files, but running. Do you know about GNU Parallel? It basically. Oh, yes. It basically is like Xargs, but it runs everything in parallel, or as much of it as it can. I think Xargs can do that too. Oh good, because I hate using parallel, because you might notice this thing, no notice. If you don't put no notice. You run one command and shut off the notice permanent. Yes. There is a command to shut it off permanent. But that says that if I ever use this and publish it, anything about it, I have to cite this guy and say how awesome he is. And I don't want to do that. I don't consider that free software if I, if I have to say. Parallel was written by this dude in Sweden who thinks he's really cool. Um, so maybe if I can do XR. Anyway, with no additional knowing how many cores I have, this basically acts as a parallel XR and runs as many copies of Tesseract as it can at a time. And so. Uh, doing the OCR and then converting it to JBIG, which is another black and white file format. It's a bit lossy, um, but we've already, um, we've already done the OCR on it, so we don't mind if it's lossy. Um, do, for the same file, it was just over two minutes as opposed to five. There is, there is a curl thing called SEM, S-E-M, mm -hmm. stands for semaphore, mm -hmm. that has roughly equivalent functionality to the new parallel and less noisy. Okay. I, it's, uh, yeah, I used it on some internals. I, I hey. used it on the internal stuff, but it's, it, it basically is similar to parallel. Good stuff. Actually, I mean, the integration with Bash was nicer. Well, yeah, this doesn't integrate with Bash at all, Will. It's really like trying to work out where you need those mustaches is just like, uh. Um, using JBIG files means that your pages are really small. And, but unfortunately, because you've been using all the cores for two minutes, this gets so hot. It's like, whoa. Um, so, save time, hot computer. What do you want to do? Um, I previous, so, some of you who are more command line based will consider this next part of my system a massive cop out. Um, if you use Windows or Mac OS, you know that you can search for things just by hitting one key and typing something. And you will find all the files that contain that, that particular term. 
and you don't even need to think about where the files go or what kind of file they are, the system just indexes it. Sure, it's a pain if you don't have very much memory or if you've got a mechanical hard drive. But if you're on a network, just that. Somebody do the Windows search. I'm glad I'm just an individual user. Um, so Linux does supply, or, or desktops do supply, uh, various indexing things. In the last talk, I was saying how great Unity Dash was. But I can't say how great Unity Dash is, because Ubuntu are basically going to kill it very soon. I think they're going to be using GNOME Tracker, um, which is a quite good desktop search. All of these, I think, use Apache Lucene as the back again database or something like that. There's Recall, which for me is the greatest way of using CPU power for not much effect. It will usually run all day and then crash and then restart again and crash. Beagle is another completely deprecated thing which works really nicely until it sees a Unicode character and then it stops forever and will never run again. No, Beagle isn't. It's it's, it's it's early GNOME. Very, very early GNOME. And it's great as long as you never use a Unicode character in your life. Might be okay with EBCDIC, I don't know. Um, so to me, using the systems index is not a cop-out. I say that because I'm standing up here. Um, I think, from my own personal history, I would be very unlikely to be able to make a consistent file system, considering I had stuff sitting in boxes, paperwork, old envelopes, socks in boxes. You know, the chances of me doing this on a computer is limited. So very likely I'll forget where I put the things, or not be able to find them, or indeed lose the filing system entirely. So if I can just have the files somewhere on my computer, somewhere sensible, and let the system find it when I need it, that's the way I make a filing system. Uh, I've worked for companies that filing systems are so complex that we had dedicated clerks who would do it, and it was an average 11 month search time to retrieve a document. These were documents describing large coal fired power stations. Um, there were tens of millions of files, all very badly indexed, um, and it contained everything from uh, you know, purchase orders for the main equipment for billions of dollars to uh, a security guard check-in, check-out record. And they thought it was a good idea of having it all in the same file system. Um, in an unrelated note, I just, I just kind of thought as I was writing this talk, hey, if I have all my bills and bank statements and everything like that in a nice searchable text place, I better be really careful that nobody ever steals this. So I should probably think about some kind of encryption. Because if somebody got into this, they could be me if they wanted such a thing. And it will get corrupted really quickly. Five years? Yes. Like as an example, like my visa statement would have mobile phone, blah, 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 blah. Then my, if I wanted to actually find my mobile phone bill, it would then be like coming up within those results as well. And more than likely the, the thing things would overpower one or the other. Isn't it better to do like more in terms of metadata based things? So like instead saying like the title of this is, you know, the final bill from this, this month and this year. Getting it, that, it that. that would be like a really nice way of doing it. The difficulty from once you've got, if you've gone from paper to PDF, you don't have the metadata. There's no, there wasn't any. Um, so you'd have to search for FIDO July 2015, say. What I was really doing this, another thing I was doing this for was, yes, my credit card bills, but also my expenses. And there's like, I was in... Uh, like Gary, Indiana, and I bought something in a gas station. So I was like, search for Indiana, and it would give me like the five documents I have. Like, oh, that one, it was around about then. And so I could do my expenses properly. Chris? Yeah, so I guess it's similarly, if, if you put dates on, I find any documents I wind up capturing. My most important thing is what's, what year did I produce that document? Yeah. 
and accounting for them as stick all, 2017 is here, 2016 is here, or and maybe yeah. partitions after that. But then you might want to put attach metadata. You might want, and I would if, you know, it's one of these, how much time do I want to spend in this? Admittedly, I am quite good with file names, and all of my scanned files, I always just start with the date, like full four-digit year, two-digit month, and everything starts that way. So maybe in me saying that I'm very disorganized, I'm actually far more organized than some other people. Um, I would like to point out that having dealt with someone who was writing a theology PhD on an 8-bit CPM machine and used file names that were the first thing that came to their mind when they created the file. So their chapter were, was Cookie, Bluebird, um, not alphabetical order, not, it was like, oh, of course, well, you know, Bluebird came after Cookie because I, you know, I had a cookie and the next day I saw a Bluebird. Oh, of course. They got their PhD, by the way. Um, Not for organization figures. I remember, there is a daemon that allows you to attach metadata on top of a file system. Say, here, you, let's tag all these files. Yes. And it's just the extended file. Uh, yes, um, extended file attributes. This is good, however, a lot of these extended file attributes, if you put on a USB key, go on. Not necessarily. There may be ways around this. Tar. Yes, there's always tar. Tar is under. And this is a bit I wanted to develop more. And the reason this talk is a bit scattershot is I spent nearly 40 minutes getting rid of a bell person at the front door today. He was determined to sell me fiber and I didn't want it. Um, if you get electronic bills, they're absolutely giant. And I, I thought this was huge that it was 250k a page. My current bell bill is about 400k a page. It includes all of the Bell corporate fonts, complete sets. So if I wanted to pretend to be Bell, I could. Um, and everything is, it's, the files are huge. And if you care about how much storage you use, which you don't really need to anymore, we could make these smaller. Um, they're PDF. So what we could do is take those PDFs, render them to a nice grayscale, the amazing thing, and this used, goes against every piece of advice that used to be said for OCR, lower resolution gray or color images has fant fantastic OCR accuracy. Really, really good. Tesseract loves gray images and color images. It's very, very accurate for that. <laughs> if we want to make them really small, we can use JPEG 2000, which it seems to hate me. Um, and then you can store those in the PDF, PDF, and it's about the same size as a black and white page. Still a work in pro progress. Hugh? There's, there are tools that can shrink PDFs with, I think, without losing Is that true? Um, there's ones that will strip out unnecessary metadata, but the ones that shrink images will well, resample. I shrinking images, I mean, like getting rid of fonts that aren't actually used. Yes. Um, but the result of those isn't always guaranteed to be something that will load. You will have to review that and see that the font was properly removed and it didn't remove fonts that you really needed. Sometimes two icons are in the font file. So you might get weird, like, you know, the, a phone symbol yeah. would be like in letter A or something. Re-encoding and subsetting of fonts is a whole thing that I know, hate, and don't want to get into right now. It's Seriously, it's, it's, it's a nightmare, but I, like we could talk about this for hours. And it, yeah, I've been bitten by that. Even you can subset a font that's used in a form. So that means you can fill in the form, but you can't use the letter K because the font doesn't include it. <sighs> um, so JPEG. Bodies by Bridge. What? James Bodies by Bridge. Yes, yes. I'm sure that would work for Mark Twain, but he's dead. Um, so JPEG 2000 is, was supposed to be the future of image formats, but unfortunately it's never been supported in the web. They're really, really small and they use clever image compression to make 
pictures look surprisingly good. There's lots of ways you can store it. You can have like multiple resolutions stored in the same file. You can be lossy or lossless. And at really low uh, or really high compression, it just turns into a horrible blur, but you've got tiny, tiny files that will load quickly and give you an overview. Um, unfortunately, so, well, here's the demo. This is the unfortunate. Um, so if I have an original JPEG, which is about a quarter of a megabyte, if I compress that to 23 kilobytes, this middle one, they're almost the same. You can barely tell the difference. There's a little bit of kind of blurriness. If you go too far and can, can compress it to 5K, yeah, that's horrible. But if it were an image or something you didn't really care too much about, it's a yeah, that's cool. oh, image itself isn't bad. Yeah, so, I mean, you went from quarter of a megabyte to 5K. Okay. Um, very processor intensive. Unfortunately, my experience with JPEG 2000 Linux is that it hates me. Um, not merely is it potentially patent encumbered, encumbered, but it used to crash Ubuntu's file browser. If it saw a JP2 file, game over. Done. <laughs> Now, because someone, one of the maintainers, has decided to go this way, they've said, well, if you want a JP2, you're actually OK with a JPEG. So Image Magic will quietly create a JPEG if you ask for a JP2. <laughs> this is very wrong. So my advice is, if you ever need these, build your own tools and keep them somewhere safe so that your distro can't touch them, because it will. But it means like they're not enough users. Um, the very, very large geo companies use um, JPEG 2000. Publishers use JPEG 2000. It's very, very widely used. Linux users, because there's this belief that it might be heavily patent encumbered, they just don't touch it. So, Miles? Did you do any tests with Web, WebP by any chance? I did. The difficulty with WebP is that it's not in directly embeddable in a PDF. Uh, um, WebP and all its other formats are really cool and really small, but you can't directly convert it to PDF. Or they might be acceptable if you could embed the text in some Yes. Yes. Did you try anything like crazy, like doing an SVG? So, like, um, vectorize it? Yeah. Vectorized things tend to be really large if you go from scanned text, uh, like like megabytes a page. Yeah. Um, I'm sure there's some clever software that recognizes fonts and will replace the font, but it would be commercial. So. Kind of off topic, but wavelet technology. Yeah. I remember that. When I, I remember using that in the early 90s. So is that still in under patent right? I don't think it can be, but the Debian distribution folks get all yeah. hit up about this. So I said there would be a lovely system by the end of the night. Unfortunately, I was too successful. I ran out of things to scan. <laughs> Once you run out of things to scan, why develop a lovely system if you have nothing else to run it on? It's very hard, I found, to come up with a single solution that will work with black and white images and color images and do them automatically and well. So my solution is a horrible little shell script that I will put up on the on the on the wiki. Um, do it, what you, I mean? Sorry? Do what I mean. Yeah. It because it does what exactly what I mean. And it will not do any of what you want, but it works for me. Um, <laughs> Well, yeah, there ain't nobody else around here. Um, it uses a whole mess of tools, but I have converted probably tens of thousands of pages using it, and it just works for me. And that's as far as I go. I could have had a lovely system, but I'm sorry. This is all I've done. So I think that's my last slide. Thank you very much. I'm going to go into business running far away from people who want to do this. Miles? Uh, what's, what's your backup strategy for the archive of the doc? 
I should have one, yeah. Um, I actually have a, um, I know NAS isn't a backup, and until very recently I had a, um, Amazon Cloud, but I, everything every day used R backup, which is a shell around rsync, to copy it to a folder on my NAS, and every night that was synced to Crash Plan, which is on Amazon. I do need to find a replacement for that, probably Amazon Glacier, maybe. I may actually ha ask if some people have used online cloud backup, anything that works well with Linux and isn't just Please, x86. Glacier is really cool. I, I've used it. Okay. Uh, how much actual storage did you end up using? Um, I think my total scanned files for all of these come to about, it's actually really small, it's probably half a gigabyte, no more than that. It's really tiny. So is it worth all that effort making it really small? I don't know. I did it because I did. Which means it's really easy to steal. Yes. You? Have you looked at all at G-Scan to PDF? It's supposed to do something very, very roughly like this. I think what G-Scan to PDF does is what that um, scan tailor can or should be able to do. I think it contains a scanner driver, a page cutter and rearranger, and then it will do to PDF, and it may even run Tesseract. Um, it has two choices, Tesseract and something else. There's one called, I think it's either Joker or Goker, it's called. It used to be the only one available. It's not, it's kind of okay. Do you want to Scott? Yeah. Um, for tools, when you're testing, did you come across uh, PDF Shuffler or PDF Shuffler? No. Um, the tool I use most for rearranging PDFs, there's two. There's PDF TK and QPDF. And PDF, what does PDF Shuffler do that? Um, let's you import any arbitrary number of PDF documents and freehand rearrange the pages and save it back out as another PDF. Okay, I think you can actually kind of do that in events as well. You can like import pages into the, but Having a tool that actually does it and someone I trust trusts it, PDF Shuffler, yeah, let's do that. I found it really useful when uh, corporations would ask me to sign the last page of the document. So I'd scan the last page, take it out, put it in the scan page. That's what people, so many offices have very expensive Adobe Acrobat Pro licenses just to do that. Anyway, Miles? Have you ever done any scanning of like, like large snapshots, and have you ever done like the, the DSLR setup where you have the DSLR pointing down and then you kind of move it around? I, I've just used my compact camera for that and moved things around, and I've used several stitching packages, particularly for maps. Um, in QGIS, it has a georeferencer, which is really good, and then there are tools that will stitch together georeference maps not seamlessly but accurately so it might not have a bit of a, an ugly edge to it but it will be properly georeferenced. Um, I have worked with the very large maps at the McMaster War Library um, which are already scanned and working with them as PDFs and georeferenced images is a challenge they get really big really quickly. Did someone else? Do you have a strategy for carrying this forward with um, what you mean that I'm not maintaining spinning disks of this or because I'm not ever backing this up on on like dead archive so it's not going to tape it's not going to hard drive it's offline um, so it um, do it so therefore do I have like a reliable offline storage I should I don't um, it would be, I mean, these would store very well to any kind of removable media because they are small, but because they rely on an index file system to be easily found, 
there would be no trying to retrieve that from Tate would be just. But in total, it's a very small amount, so it would, you know, you could probably put it on a cassette tape, actually. Um, I could, yeah. Um, I don't know how well Tracker or Recall handles additional file systems added to itself, or and it doesn't store its metadata along with it. The no, files. No, the idea is that you create a, 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 a loopback file system. Yep. Fill your that file system and then just copy that one file as a uh, onto the other. So when you are when you want to actually read it, you actually have to mount that file as a that file system. What are the odds of that working in ten years? I have five that file systems from the late nineties that still work. So I, like, it's a very it's a very normal thing that they go. Uh, that it's used, especially in Linux. No, I understand that, and I, but unfortunately, I've used look back TrueCrypt file systems that no longer work. So uh, yeah, that's because you encrypted them. <laughs> <laughs> but if this contains as much personal data as some of this stuff does, maybe I should. Yes. So, um, Hugh, did you? Anyone? Um, I was wondering. Your process must have worked wonderfully well to digitize your. Boxes and boxes. Um, but does it work well incrementally as well? Is the workflow best done once a year, or can you do it every week? Or what do you do? You can do it every week. I run that same script, say, if I get any paper in that I need to digitize. Um, I just run it as needed. Um, my main problem is keeping on top of the files that I've scanned to the scanner. And remembering what they were and like deleting them in an organized fashion and that's where having it automated would be really nice um, but it really it just it's a simple shell script that you can either you can either script itself if you've got multiple files or and it just quietly plows through the images and converts them to searchable PDF and I move them to the right folder and it's not that much work it could be more automated, but it's the kind of level of effort I'm happy with. So, yeah. Is your partner? She is immensely happy that we're no longer tripping over stillages full of old paper. Is she operator or is she passing it to you? Uh, I handle the filing. Uh, which, yeah, maybe I should. We should share that, but equally. She has her own paper filing system that she can actually find stuff in. So I married a keeper. She can find paper, which is just, I know. Oh, there's no other. Okay. Have you ever thought of doing any like, really cool stuff in the image recognition? So, like, you know, having some machine learning where, like, this is a bill for X, and then having it, like, with a percentage of the error, trying to figure out and, like, catalog it? Yeah, you could, because I mean, you've got really nice. I mean, a standard bill will, ha you know, for while that company keeps its visual identity, will have recognizable like blue and lighter blue and like, the big thing that probably says bell, and you yeah. can probably recognize that. And you can pull that out of the um, Hoker file actually, because it says position and size of text and even color of text if you've got a color scan. So you could use some. I just don't know the libraries. Uh, that I would run to do it, but yeah. You can sort of do a you can do a rough similarity of partitioning. And say all the bell bills look kind of the same, and so that makes it easy to apply tags to them on mass. Yeah. As, and the moment that bell changes the format of the bill, well, you you have to you have to be do. Yeah. But that's that's not actually a pro that's not a big problem because they don't change it every month. No. You'll have you know, okay, the old format won't be noticed anymore. We will have to notice the new one. Yeah. Uh, extending that, just let let recognize different classes and use the classification. You'll, what you'll end up with is 1937 through 1945 bell bills, 1945 through whatever bell bills, etc. But 
the No, no, no. I, I, you know, these are these are all good. I mean, there is a. I can't remember the the Windows software for the the Fujitsu Scan Snap does all that. We'll try and say I think this is a bill from this, and we'll suggest, and you can train it. Apparently, I don't never use it, um, so it's possible. Yeah. Do you ever have like the where you don't get a PDF base bill? It's like an HTML table bill. Do you have like a way of storing notes on each other? Or just even? Do OCR on HTML? <laughs> <laughs> well, long, long shot. I mean, I, I'm guessing you know everybody knows about the CUPS PDF driver that basically is a printer that makes, spits PDF files out so that you never ever need to print anything ever again. I love it. Um, it doesn't produce the greatest PDFs, but it'll do. Um, <laughs> I have found HTML files that will not convert to anything. However, um, in the last month, I found an amazing utility for producing paper documents from PDFs. I think it's called is it Weasley Print. It's a Python thing. It will from nice from reasonable HTML. It will produce books. It's amazing. I've never seen anything that types out HTML. I think it's called oh Weasy Print. Weasy Print. W e a s y Print. Easy from Jefferson's. I wouldn't know. Cultural reference that I'm missing. Um, but it's really good. And I, I'm a former book typesetter, and I'm like, hey, it does all the stuff right. So Wheezy Print is kind of magic. And for something, yeah. I think, I think we've run to our time. Thank you very much for your patience. I have lots of other stuff about scanning that I know other people have questions. Maybe we'll do that in the pub. So... Thank you. Thank you.